All right. Well, my uh, group is uh, working on the role of energy in production. And the fact that it has to be worked on, I think, is an indictment of economics, not just neoclassical economics, but the post-Keynesian school that I'm associated with as well. Um, now, what we're doing is, is two things. We're extending existing production functions and economics, both Cobb Douglas and Leontief, to include energy in a fundamental way. And the other side is that there's work done by a meteorologist whose specialty is the mathematics of cloud formation and snowflake formation, uh, so he's kind of an expert on snowflakes, uh, deriving an economic model from the concepts of thermodynamics. And his work, and I'll start with a slide from that, shows a relationship between, uh, it rather theoretically derives the possibility of a relationship between not GDP, but the integral of GDP, accumulated production and energy consumption. And there's equally work, which I haven't included here, showing a relationship between GDP itself and energy consumption. So we're doing those two pieces of work together. Uh, the research team is, uh, to start with the person who's uh, coming in from the outside, this is Tim Garrett. He's a professor of uh, atmospheric sciences at Utah University, and his main research focus is the mathematics and physics of clouds, cloud formation, in particular snowflake formation. And he developed, uh, from starting from fir first principles of thermodynamics, models of civilization, not just capitalism, but civilization in general, uh, from the mathematics of thermodynamics. Matthias Fraselli. Matthias uh, is a professor of mathematics at McMaster University in um, Canada. And his primary research focus today is on building monetary non-equilibrium macroeconomic models. And me, and the same thing applies to me. That's pretty much my research focus. A few other topics, of course, but that's the primary area that I'm working on. Uh, I have no idea where that slide has not been properly animated. Let's go back. OK. OK, I'm getting an entire slide there. It must be the setup of the, um, of the simulation here rather than my own. I prefer to have a line of text coming down at a time. So there's my red card, Roger, for mathematics on screen. Uh, if you look at neoclassical and post-Keynesian theories of production, they both talk about production uh, being in the creation of goods using labour and capital. And if you look at that, where's energy? It's not explicitly stated. And when you look at what pe people in physics say, if you don't include energy in explanation of virtually anything, you haven't got an explanation of anything. This is a wonderful quote from a, uh, the, 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 the sort of both physicists who actually proved Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, experimentally verified that, that uh, theory, uh, but also was a populariser of physics in the, in the 1930s. And he said, if you have a theory which is in contradiction with the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope but to collapse in utter humiliation. You don't have a theory. And fundamentally, that applies to economics in general, not just the neoclassical school, which I think you all know I'm a critic of, but the post-Keynesian as well. We have not incorporated energy properly. And if you look at uh, the way that this is taught to students, and it's still part of the mental mindset of anybody doing their research today, we talk about the circular flow. Here are a couple of examples of the circular flow logic. Now you have uh, factors, factor markets, you have goods markets, households, firms, circulation of money, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at that diagram, there is no non-economic input. There's no input in that system that is not produced within the economy itself. Um, and all output is also consumed inside the economy. There's nothing coming from the economy to anything outside the economy. Now, that implies that you can produce all the inputs within the economy in a closed system. It implies a closed system can grow. That violates the first law of thermodynamics because you can't make energy. You can't create it, it simply exists. It's free in that sense. Um, and it implies that a closed system can produce output and grow, which it can't do, that violates the second law. Um, and you can have production without waste, which also violates the second law and the third law. Um, so the only reason we can actually have the circular flow is because we're exploiting energy that exists in the universe before we ever existed. We're, we're taking advantage of that energy to create output. And, of course, that's the, the obvious sources are, are solar energy, fossil fuels, and nuclear energy. Now, we can't produce energy. That's the first law of thermodynamics. 
It's, it simply exists. We can transform, we can't change the quantity, we can't create it. Uh, we can only exploit energy that currently exists and we convert it from one form into another. And we necessarily generate waste when we do that. That's the, that's the second law of thermodynamics. You can minimise waste, you cannot eliminate it. I think a lot of the mindset of economists is as if waste can be eliminated. Perfect competition, etc., etc. So those are the second and third laws. And to make that so-called circular flow diagram realistic, we need to add the fact that outputs from outside the economy, pre-existing energy that we're exploiting to produce and do useful work, and we have to inject waste back into that environment. Then we have something which is at least on the way towards being realistic. So something like this, you talk about solar energy, fossil fuel, nuclear power as well. On the planet, there's our economy within it. We exploit that energy, that lets us do useful work, which is what drives the economy. We necessarily generate waste. And the waste necessarily exceeds the amount of useful work we can, we can make out of that energy as well. Now, why can't we produce um, without using already existing energy? And why can't we produce without using waste? Well, these are the laws of thermodynamics. Now, a bit like the laws of quantum mechanics, one of the jokes is if you think you understand it, therefore you don't. Okay? It's not exactly straightforward. Even people who work in the aerostatic still have to get their heads around it. But they're empirically absolutely true rules about the nature of work and energy. And they were developed in the late 19th century. And if you look at when they were developed, it predates Marx, though Marx actually did correspond with some of the leading uh, developers of early thermodynamics. And it predated neoclassical economics as well. Neoclassical economics was basing itself on physics 20 or 30 years before this developed. There's something Murawski calls a, a theory of energetics before the theory of thermodynamics actually developed. And there are really complicated rules of mathematics to understand it as closely as one can. can. But I think it's best conveyed by a joke. And the joke comes from Allen Ginsberg, in fact, and he summarised the laws of thermodynamics in three ways. Law, rule one is you can't win. So why would you play the game? Rule is you can't, two is you can't even break even. And rule three is you can't leave the game. <laughs> Those are the rules. Now, what does it actually mean in, in a more informative version? Well, you can't win, you can only break even in terms of energy. You can only take what energy exists and hopefully convert it into 100% useful work. But you can't do that unless you can dump the waste in a unit place in the universe, which is at the temperature of absolute zero. Zero degrees Kelvin, zero Kelvin minus 273 degrees Celsius. There is no such place. That's the third law. So you simply can't do it. Now what it means is you can neither create energy nor destroy it, you can simply change its form. The maximum amount of energy you can use is always limited by where, we, where you dump your waste and you can only get all that energy converted into useful work if there's somewhere that's absolute zero and there's no such place. So those are the basic laws of thermodynamics. Now, it gets worse because to actually exploit that free energy, to turn that coal into work that turns a turbine, uh, you must be dumping that waste into an external environment. Uh, because a closed system will degrade to a uniform temperature over time. If you imagine having a, uh, a power station where you've got a, a boiler and you've then got a, a turbine turning, uh, the only way that turbine is going to turn is if you dump the waste heat back into the environment. That's why cooling towers exist. If you didn't have a cooling tower, ultimately the temperature would be even. Either side of the turbine, the turbine would not turn. So you simply have to dump waste into the environment. Without that dumping of the waste, no power can be extracted, no work can be done. So waste is inevitable. There's no useful work without waste. And that's a totally different mindset to the perfect competition mindset that economists start with. And what we've done, again, I'm sorry that slide isn't properly animated, it was supposed to be. Um, Neither neoclassical economics nor post-Keynesian had anything fundamental to say about that. People have modified the framework, but they haven't done it at a deep level. And I was frustrated with the attempts to bring in energy into the Cobb Douglas production function being done by people like Solo back in the 1970s in re reaction to the limits to growth, and even work by Bob Ayres and friends where they 
what they call a Linux you know, production function, where a, a step in that was having energy as the third input. And the insight occurred to me actually working with Bob Ayres and staying in his flat in, in, in Paris, which is full of statues, uh, that labour without energy is a corpse, and capital without it, machinery without energy is a sculpture. To actually make them move, you have to have energy. And that's a very simple insight. What it means is you say energy is an input to both labour and capital. Rather than being a separate input in its own right, labour must consume energy to be alive, to do work. Machines have to take energy in to be able to turn the cogs and actually turn that energy into useful work. So you simply make it a, you know, a, a, a product function. It's, a, it's, a, it's inside. You have labour. En energy is an input to labour. Capital is an input to labour. And you then work through what's, what's the logical uh, impact of doing that. Again, my animations have been totally stuffed up here, so my apologies. The equations are even worse than I thought they might turn out to be. But the Cobb Douglas production function, you restart it and say, well, let's think of it in terms of energy, and say it's labour with an energy input raised to a power, capital with its energy input raised to one minus that power, and then say, well, what is the actual labour? Well, labour is, when you, when you take a look at the, the components, you can say it's the number of workers times the calorie input that those workers consume times how efficiently they convert that energy into work. Now, if you look at uh, the amount of energy we consume on a daily basis, it's tens of thousands, well, it's, it's certainly hundreds of times the amount of energy that a Roman slave would have, would have consumed. The amount of work we do is identical or lower. The amount of work a human can do is about 90 watts for about 8 to 12 hours. That's about the maximum we can sustain. So you treat that as a constant. But the machinery, when you think about what happens with machinery, when we're frozen here, um, the number of machines times the energy input to machines times how efficiently that's converted, the energy going into a machine has risen exponentially over the history particularly of capitalism. We've gone from the days of the Smith steam engine where the consumption of that engine was roughly 10 tonnes of coal per day to the Musk Falcon 9 which consumes 9 tonnes of fuel per second. So that's the real reason we go from labour-based systems like hand looms to the spinning jenny and then on further. You can simply get more energy into it. Once you convert the mechanical, you develop the mechanical system to do what the labour used to do, you can do far more than the labour could because the energy input is not limited. So once you do that, you'll get a number of results that come out of it. And again, I would have liked to have those points coming up one by one. One of the conundrums in neoclassical theory has been the solar residual. Why is so much of the change in production attributed to the A, total fat attractive productivity? It's because when you work out the logic, that is the energy consumption capacity of the representative machine of the time. That's why, that's why so much of the productivity turns up in the A term rather than labour or capital. Then also the exponent, the energy component, is the same as capital. And when you look at it that way, you say, well, why do we have such a large exponent for the labour component and such a small one for capital? It really reflects the um, quirk that the cobb douglas production function is simply a transformation of the income distribution. Uh, output equals labour, uh, wages plus profits. You can transform that into cobb douglas production function. That's why the coefficient works out to being 0.3 for capital and 0.7 for labour. That's roughly the income distribution. But there's no reason for that in terms of productive systems. It's much more sensible to see that exponent being far higher to reflect the role of energy in production. Uh, what we call the capital output ratio in terms of a Leontief function is actually the efficiency with which machines convert energy into useful work. It's the inverse of that. So you can explain another element of economic theory, which again, which is a, a funny, wide statistical relationship apply. It's actually underlying it is the role of energy in production. And what we call labour productivity has got bugger all to do with labour productivity. It's the ratio of the energy throughput of machinery to the energy throughput of people. That's been rising over time. There's no point making your workers more productive. It's giving the machines handling more energy that increases that term in the Leontio function. So you eliminate a large number of conundrums by bringing in this logic. Um, and one part of it which ties up with the whole sustainability issue once you acknowledge energy, you must acknowledge waste. 
Once you've got waste in the system, the question is what's the capacity of the biosphere to handle that waste? Um, and just to give a couple of illustrations of where we've got to in our modelling so far, uh, I've built a, a, taken the Goodwin growth cycle model, which I'm, some people in the room are familiar with, and we've now converted that to have the production not being uh, capital divided by the capital output ratio, but the energy throughput of the machine multiplied by the growth of that energy over time. And uh, if I can just go across to, as, as part of that, because we generate production that way, we also generate waste. It's the gap between the energy input and the useful work output. And you therefore show waste as a necessary outcome, and you can also, of course, exhaust your energy supplies. So this is just a very simple illustration of that, and I'll change over here. So what we've added to the, the simple Goodwin model here, which gives you cycles in both employment and wage share over time, uh, we've added in a resource constraint and saying, just looking simply at fossil fuels and saying you've got a certain stock of fossil fuels. If we were only using fossil fuels, then at some point you reach the point where, oh my God, we've exhausted them. The breakdown occurs well before you exhaust the total <coughs> supply, but you can then show a collapse in production. Okay? Equally, if we put waste inside there, we now have the waste being generated, we could then have the impact of the waste on the capacity of the productive system to generate output, which would reduce the efficiency with which that energy was converted into useful work. So it's a way to integrate economic uh, production into ecology. And that's already been done again from a thermodynamic point of view by, uh, by Tim Garrett's work. And what he's using here is the idea that for a cloud to form, you need an energy source. So think of the, um, think of the ocean outside of Bermuda, giving you heat, which then goes into a structure, which in that case is a cloud. And the cloud, the, the, the storm will grow if the energy um, interface between the cloud and the hot water rises and then that's dumped into the environment. Now exactly the same idea was used by Tim to talk about what happens with economics. We have an energy source, freely existing. We exploit that to create a structure we call the economy. For that to function, we have to dump that waste back into the environment. And from that he's derived a set of rules about the interaction between climate, uh, between the economy, carbon dioxide and damaging the capacity of the system to regenerate itself. And I'll quickly show that in another model. And if you don't have decarbonisation happening fast enough, then what you have ultimately is you are living, your GDP is living off your existing wealth and destroying your productive capacity. And of course that's what we see as the danger, what we're doing at the moment. Our sustainability of our society is being compromised by the extent to which we're exploiting those free resources and necessarily dumping that waste into the environment. Unless we do something about a rapid transition, Tim argues that in a paper he calls No Way Out, that there's no possibility of growth at the same time as we decarbonise, given the speed at which we'd need to decarbonise to avoid a breakdown. But the, the rate of calculus, his calculation is roughly we'd need to be building one nuclear power station a day for the next 20 or 30 years to decarbonise sufficiently not to cause that carbon overload. Now that's something which I know people dispute in that, in that same field, but the speed of transition becomes an essential issue, which economics again has said virtually nothing about so far. So that's what we're working on. With, uh, with uh, we want to expand the model to include matter in, in, in inputs as well as energy. At the moment we've gone from a, a widget or a corn economy model, which is the standard economic model for both, both Keynesian and neoclassicals, across to energy. Now the reality is we can use energy to convert matter into more useful forms, and therefore we dump both waste energy and waste matter back into the environment. So the next stage is to expand the model in that direction. We also want to have multi-sectoral multi production model properly because, again, the form of waste depends upon the sectors you're using and you think about consumption itself, that can also be sectorised into what different forms in which useful energy is consumed by consumers in the economy. And then taking that thermodynamically valid model, as, as Tim has, has done as well, and ex expanding that further. So we hope to get to the stage, we certainly will get to the stage of a set of Goodwin models with debt as well, so the Minsky side of work that I'm also doing, hopefully multi-sectoral by the end of the project, but that's not a given. And taking the thermodynamic 
arguments and integrating those with economic analysis in general. Thank you.